not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I call your attention to that sound mind being not a spirit of fear, but rather of love. And uh, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ very deeply and uh, for real, then you have no fear of the judgment. Know the Lord is your personal Savior. Uh, I talk to you about guarding that sound mind and keeping it saturated with the Lord Jesus Christ, even meditating upon the Lord and keep your mind stayed on Him, looking at the brighter side of things like you're uh, told to do and keeping every thought uh, in uh, bringing into obedience uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the way you guard the sound mind. I talk to you about girding up a sound mind by what you read, by gearing for the future, by remembering how God has fulfilled His promises. And then I said, I think in closing, uh, gearing up to difficulty, uh, a sound mind is not afraid to suffer, knowing the Lord did, not ashamed of afflictions, uh, knowing the Lord uh, or afraid or ashamed of afflictions, knowing that that's part of the deal, comes with it. Uh, also, uh, to not be uh, afraid uh, of not that you've got the personal will of God down uh, right to the T, knowing that. And also, uh, we looked at women of faith uh, because we've seen women like that even in our church. Uh, we know that difficulties can be handled. They've handled them before. We certainly can handle them. I think of Fox's Book of Martyrs and uh, some of the stories in there where young girls uh, stayed pure in spite of major difficulties and opposition. They remained pure uh, and uh, they maintained their chastity. And I think of that. And women, if women could do it, then uh, we can do it as well. And I mentioned also an extensive prayer life. If you've got an extensive prayer life and you're ready for difficulty, God's going to see you through. Uh, so the lessons are going to be the sound mind was number one, sound doctrine, number two, sound speech, number three. First Timothy chapter 1, verse number 10. You're reading about uh, sound doctrine. And you read that also uh, in Second Timothy chapter 4 and Titus chapter number 1. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 10. The Bible says, For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine made mention of in First Timothy. All right, look at Second uh, Timothy and look at chapter 4, verse number 3. Chapter 4 and verse number 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. All right, and you and I know that that day is on us. Uh, they really don't even care anything about doctrine. It's everything else uh, from sports, you name it, to music, to about anything else out there. An experience, a feeling, uh, they got it all. A doctrine they don't care nothing about. Uh, the time will come they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. And not worrying about doctrinal truth. All they want to know is uh, something that uh, satisfies them and tickles their ears. All right, Titus chapter 1 and verse number 9. Titus 1, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Chapter 2 and verse number 1. Titus 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound, in, in faith, in charity, in patience. Or you can see from the mention made there that you are dealing with the situation where in the Word of God, to Timothy and to Titus, uh, he's talking about sound doctrine as being very, very extremely important. Uh, take your Bible, look at First Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6. He talks about good doctrine. First uh, Timothy 4 verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. All right, so those things are important. Uh, Paul makes mention of to Timothy and to Titus, two letters to Timothy, one to Titus. He talks about sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. He talks about good doctrine, and he talks about being sound in the faith. Uh, look at chapter 1, the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse number 13. Titus 1, verse 13. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. All right, then the Lord doesn't want you wishy-washy. He wants you to be stable, steadfast, and doctrinally stable 
as well. Sound doctrine, very important. All right, now, Timothy is what? Timothy is called a son in the faith. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 2. And about everything tonight will be out of First, Second Timothy and Titus. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 2. Unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith. All right, spiritual son, son in the faith. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 17 for a moment. And the same type of thing. 1 Corinthians 4, verse number 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Son, a son in the faith. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse number 2. 2 Timothy 1, verse 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. But it's a son in the faith. Look at Titus chapter 1 and verse number 4. Titus 1 verse number 4. To Titus mine own son after the common faith. All right, like Timothy, Titus also a son in the faith. Mine own son after the common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. All right, then apparently he's very concerned about uh, those that he had won to the Lord, and he's concerned about doctrine, so much so that you read it over and over and over in First and Second Timothy and Titus, uh, you read it a ton of times, something like 15 times you read the word. Then apparently uh, with his uh, converts, or you might say his son in the faith, he's very, very concerned uh, lest they should be deceived. Now, new converts, are they're always a, a prey. They're going to be preyed upon, not prayed for, but preyed upon, P-R-E-Y, and uh, they're going to be, uh, try the, somebody's going to try to use them. Deception's always going to be out there for the new convert, and Paul wants Timothy and Titus to be very sound and not fall into deception like a new convert is so prone to do. Now, uh, there are groups of people that, when it comes to new converts, they're just uncanny in how they can, like almost, I'd say, smell out a new convert. Somebody gets saved, next thing you know, they're after them. I mean, they might live right next door to them for 15 years, never witnessed to them, but you win them to the Lord, and instantly they're on their case and try to get them. Well, now you got it, but you don't have it all, that type of thing. Years ago, whenever Roger got saved, I told him, I said, well, I said, uh, you need to be careful now because uh, the Pentecostals are going to be after you. They were after me. Quickly as I got saved, they're on my case, and uh, they were after me. And so I told him, I said, they're going to be after you. And he hadn't been saved a couple of weeks, and he said, uh, they've already been around. <laughs> I, was, I was late. I should have told him. As soon as he got up from the altar, I should have said, Roger, be careful. They're going to be after you. And I waited a couple of weeks, and they were already on his case, and it was a neighbor uh, who had witness to him, but just as quickly as he found out Roger got saved, man, there he was knocking at the door. So uh, the new converts, you win somebody to the Lord, you need to be extremely careful uh, about them and about doctrinal truth with them, just exactly as Paul was about Timothy and Titus. Sound doctrine is very, very important. Now, uh, sometimes you have situation, of course, one of my major jobs is, uh, found in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm to keep you sound in the faith, sound doctrine, and I'm to keep you from grabbing on to every wind of doctrine that comes through, and there's going to be plenty of them coming your way. Uh, something comes shooting through there, and somebody grabs on to it, sounds good, and so they uh, hop on to it, and part of my job is to keep you from jumping at everything and being tossed to and fro, finally coming out, don't even know what you believe, don't know, well, you know, maybe this, maybe that, not even sure what you believe. Part of my job is to edify you and build you up, not tear you apart, but build you up. Not uh, endless genealogies which minister questions, but rather godly edifying. That's my job. All right, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. End of the verse, pastors and teachers. 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All right? 14, till we hence, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. That's what happens in a new convert. They don't even know. Somebody put on me when I first got saved. You believe that damn old doctrine, once saved, always saved. And uh, I didn't even, didn't even, never heard of eternal security. Didn't know nothing about it. I didn't even 
have a clue. But they, you know, they're always uh, jumping on your case and trying to get you unhinged, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man. They're tricky and cunning craftiness, and they're good at it. Whereby they lie in wait to deceive. They're not out. They're out to use you, and uh, they know they can grab the new convert. They can twist him and warp him and uh, mislead him and. Uh, make him think that there's a little bit more to it now. If they just, you know, jump into my camp, we'll add to it, and we'll really get you saved, and we'll really get, you know, uh, we'll get you a whole lot more. Uh, it's just uh, it's a deceptive type of thing uh, that you need to be careful for. Now, as a Christian, and uh, a lot of y'all been around a while, and you're not brand new converts, uh, but you've got to be careful because the flesh always wants a feeling. And the flesh is out for... It loves the spectacular and the pizzazz. The flesh is, uh, it craves something new. That's just the old nature. And the old nature, it's kind of like the Athenians in Acts chapter number 19 or the Ephesians, whichever one it was there. Uh, they spent their time to hear or tell something new. It's like now what do you have? I mean, we're so bad about in this country. They have news on all day long. They're stations, nothing but news, 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 news. And people listen to it. I hear or tell every new thing. Well, likewise, because the old nature wants to grab onto something like that, the same thing is true spiritually. They want the latest. They want the newest. They want all the new doctrines that are out there. And it just has to do with the old nature wanting something new. And the flesh desiring the spectacular or the flesh desiring something that nobody else would have. So my job is to keep you from jumping too quick and uh, getting messed up. Now, look at it this way, and here's what happens to Christians. They're, the old nature is, of course, nothing happens to it, so there's a, always going to be the problem with self-righteousness. And you've always gonna, you're always going to have to fight the thing. And, but the self-righteous nature, old nature, in the Christian that's been born again, uh, that self-righteous nature just would love to get something that nobody else has. All right, here's, you know, Bible Believers Baptist Church right here. And that old nature loved to have something up here. I'd like to put you a cut above Bible Believers Baptist Church. That just goes with it. And you're always going to have to fight that type of a thing. Most of the time, and sometimes you'll get something up in here. But most of the time, and most of you all are going to be just like me. You're going to go all through your life, and you'll probably never get no major new doctrine. I mean, you might get a tidbit here or there, but you'll probably not get any major doctrine. I could not understand it when I was down in Pensacola. Dr. Uckman talked about how I taught, you know, say the doctrine of the great deeps, and I taught it for 15 years. I said, you've only been saved 16 years, 17 years, and you've taught it. That means two years after you got saved. How come I don't get something like that, you know? And, of course, he'd read the Bible through 26 times at that point and said something ought to be coming through. But I've been through it 26 times, and it still doesn't come through for me like that. And uh, so I'll just, you know, learn off somebody else. But most of you all are going to be like me. You're going to get a little bit here, a little bit there, tidbit here, tidbit there. And don't be jumping on everything that comes through because that flesh wants to grab it and get something up here above anybody else. Be satisfied just to be sound in doctrine. That's major in the Bible. To Timothy, first and second Timothy, to Titus and Titus chapter one, he emphasized sound doctrine. Don't worry about the new. Don't worry about grabbing something uh, above anybody else. Be satisfied with that which is stable and solid and sound and will prove out and will get you uh, safely through to the rapture in real good shape. Sound doctrine. You know, as I situation there, I think of Dr. Ruckman, I think, you know, there's one Dr. Ruckman. There's one Dr. Ruckman. There's not two, there's one. There's one C.I. Schofield, right? In his time, he was the man. You can read everybody else's material there. There was one C.I. Schofield, all right? There was one Clarence Larkin. You read all the other material out there, and primarily there's one Clarence Larkin, there's one, Dr. M. R. D. Hahn. But you ever read Dr. D. Hahn stuff? He was a doctor. I mean, he was an actual doctor. You don't just, you know, become a doctor without having some smarts. So he was the actual doctor. 
He, uh, Lord calls him to preach. Uh, he remembered uh, living like the devil. He remembered the songs his mother taught him on her knees. And uh, he gets things right. And the Lord calls him to preach. And Dehan, if you read his stuff, old Dr. Dehan, new guy's not worth reading. Uh, but uh, old Dr. Dehan, if you read his stuff, uh, it's primarily Schofield and Larkin. That's what it is. So the Lord sometimes will take somebody and put something on him, put something on him, put something on him uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But you and I are going to probably be just, you know, the common Christian that, you know, is sound in doctrine and reads the Word of God. And maybe God gives you a little bit, gives you a couple of verses. John got a couple the other day and things like that. Uh, but that's probably as far as you go. But be thankful that at least you're stable and sound, know what you believe, and why you believe it. All right, here's a classic illustration of what the flesh wants. Preacher. And his preacher, he gets up at a preacher's fellowship, and he preaches, in 25 minutes, he preaches seven of the furthest out doctrines of Dr. Ruckman in 25 minutes. Seven of them in one message. You know what he wants? He wants acclamation. Ooh, wow, wow, man, I can't believe it. It's crazy. And the one a matter of fact, when you try and take something like that and treat it in 25 minutes, you can't even come close to tweet, treating it. Each one's an hour to an hour and a half, and all you're going to do is make people think you're crazy, which they did. The one preacher said, you got your tie on crooked. He thought the guy, you're cuckoo, man, you're nuts. See, because it's an... You, you don't go like that. But that's what the flesh wants. It wants something beyond sound doctrine. It wants something beyond anything anybody else has. Oh, I had a fellow come down when I was in Pensacola, a young man, 18 years of age. I call him Cowboy Bill. He came in there and he was, uh, had the cowboy atmosphere about him. Uh, came through, was from Detroit, came in on a Saturday afternoon, came to the street meeting and preached. Came to church on Sunday, Monday afternoon, woke Dr. Ruckman up from his nap. And he wanted Dr. Uckman to teach him the doctrine of the great deeps. You know what Dr. Uckman told him? Stick around for three years, you'll get it all. You know how long he stuck around? He never made three weeks. Campus for Crusade for Christ was, was uh, down singing a bunch of young people down the beaches of uh, Florida somewhere. Came by, stopped in a Saturday night Bible study on the way to Texas. And uh, they kept on rolling after one Saturday night Bible study. Cowboy Bill kept on rolling right with him. Unstable as water. What does God want you to do? He wants you to be sound in doctrine. Sound doctrine is important. It's exceptionally important for the new Christian. There's always going to be the temptation. It doesn't matter whether you're new or old. Uh, to make yourself a cut above other Christians. Oh, I'll show you why I say that. Titus chapter 1. Look at verse 7. For bishop. Oh. A bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given a wine, no striker, not given a filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine. Then the exhortation there is to who? It's to somebody like myself. It's to the overseer, to the bishop, to the elder. All right, so... Uh, ordain elders in every city, verse number 5. Bishop, verse number 7. Sound doctrine, verse number 9. Then God ever puts you in a place like I have right here, uh, then you want to make sure that you don't just jump out and try to put all the latest, biggest stuff that maybe, may not, hadn't really proved out yet, uh, be true. You want to make sure that sound doctrine, you remain sound in doctrine. Be able by sound doctrine. All right, if you go beyond that, they're going to say, the guy's crazy, man. He, that guy don't have it together. But if you just keep on putting it out, sound doctrine, sound doctrine, be able to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. All right? Again, I say it's a temptation. Look at the aged. Chapter 2, verse number 1. Again, somebody like myself. I might as well admit to it. All right, chapter 2, verse number 1. Uh, but speak thou of the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged man, aged. So it's always a temptation to try to grab something that comes flying through there and uh, grab some new doctrine. All right, sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. So then it's, it's something for 
somebody that uh, maybe they've been sound for years and years to remain on track. I'll give you an example. Harold Welch is very, very sound. And about, uh, oh, say 10, 15 years ago, that put Harold about, say, 50 years of age or 55, about 50 years of age, we'll say. And some guy comes through there and he says, uh, man, I want you to come to my church. And, and so you and Blake Manor, a lot of new things out there. I mean, a lot of new doctrine. And Harold says, uh, so I want you to talk to somebody. And Harold says, okay. He said, I'll talk to him. He said, remember, no stories, just the word of God. Never brought him around. You know why? Because they're, they won't tell you stories, you know, big stories, miraculous stories. This, and that's not it. Sound doctrine is what it's supposed to be. And uh, so even as the years come and the years go, uh, you remain sound in doctrine. All right? The aged men. Then of all things, he skips the women, I guess because the women are, you know, they're, that's, uh, they know their place. And so as a result, they're, you know, it's not going to be their problem. All right, six. Titus chapter one verse, or two verse number six. Young men. All right, then uh, the exhortation comes through not only to the aged men, but to the young men as well. Young men exhort, likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. All right, then to these young men, what do you do? You exhort them. Don't be jumping on everything that comes through. Remain sound. Stay sound. Stay with what you're sure of. Let the other stuff lay. Don't try to be the spectacular one, some grabbing onto some new thing or preaching some new doctrine, some wild doctrine. All right? In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness. All right? Titus chapter 2 and verse number uh, 9. Exhort servants, all right, to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, it's like stealing, uh, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. All right, then it's a temptation. And uh, the, I guess you might say you're going to have somebody always trying to deceive you. And as a new Christian, you can be sure they're going to be out there uh, trying to do a number on you like you would not believe. Uh, and it's going to be a temptation as time goes on for you and I to want to grab some doctrine that is very iffy. And uh, you want to be careful to hold still. And uh, it's this way. Bell said one time, uh, pertaining to hyper dispensationalism, that's trying to you know work him on into it. He said, "Look, is there anything to it?" He said, "They don't need me. It'll fly without me, right? And if it's uh, no good, then I, you know, I certainly don't want to be connected with it. So he just stayed away from it, and proved to be a very, very wise decision. And likewise, there's something out there that don't need you. If there's anything to it? It'll fly without you. See, hold still, give things some time." Do some reading. Do some praying. Keep coming through your Bible like you're supposed to. And see what the Lord puts on you. You might be surprised. Sound doctrine is important. And I say that because... Uh, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. End of the verse there. That thou mightest charge some that teach no other doctrine. Uh, in verse number 10. End of the verse there. If there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Doctrine is very, very important. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, and you already looked at verse number 6, uh, words of faith and of good doctrine. Uh, look at verse number 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. All right, look at verse 16, a ministry rises or falls on doctrine, believe it or not. Nowadays, it's as though throw it out the window, man, get you a big old sports complex and a sports program and get you a big name connected with it, and you'll fly. Well, where are you going? I mean, uh, what's the, you know, and nothing connected with church, but I mean, that's how they do it. A ministry, a, a Bible ministry, rises or falls on doctrine. 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. I go off the deep end, I preach to 50 or 100 people, I take 50 or 100 people off the deep end, I destroy a ministry, I throw away what I've got, uh, and as a result, and you go down with me. 
What a pitiful thing. It's that important. A ministry, the life or death of a ministry, depends on the right kind of doctrine or good doctrine. Years back, I had a friend of mine that uh, I'd preached for, had a church, the thing was alive like you would not believe, uh, and all of a sudden he got wrapped up in some other doctrine. He asked me to preach. I said, remember, I'm a Baptist preacher. And he said, okay, but please come preach for me. I said, okay, I'll come preach. After the meeting, we got to a, a restaurant and began to question him. And here's a guy that altered his position and didn't even have verses knowing why he altered it. If I was going to alter, believe me, I would have those things ingrained in my heart, mind, and soul. But uh, at that point, he didn't seem to have. But that church went down, 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 down. They finally sold it. I mean, it, it just it just folded, and they wound up selling the building. Thing, there's nothing there anymore. And doctrine is that important, believe it or not. It's that important to this church. I mean, if I stray, we go down, down, down. Pretty soon people leave. Pretty soon we go. And next thing you know, Bible believers, Baptists, yeah, I remember there was a church like that one time out there in the hillside. And many years ago, I remember that. What a pitiful thing. It rises or falls on right doctrine. All right? Uh, look at chapter uh, 5, verse number 17. Let the elders that rule well be kind worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, chapter 6 and verse number 1. End of the verse. That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Chapter 6 and verse 3. And of the doctrine which is according to godliness. All right? So you can see the emphasis... I mean, I have read to you or called your attention to eight verses in a book that has six chapters, 1 Timothy, just a small book. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 10, verse 15, chapter 4, verse 2, verse 3, Titus, chapter 1, verse 9, chapter 2, verse 1, verse 10, seven more, 15 times in three short books. God places a lot of emphasis on doctrine, but especially Sound doctrine. Okay, let's think of some sound doctrine. Now, here's some sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. That is the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at First Timothy. We're going to primarily stay with the book here, uh, with First, Second Timothy, and Titus. Uh, but First uh, Timothy, chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle, Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ. That's saying that Jesus Christ is God, our Savior. That's the statement of verse 1, verse number, uh, chapter 1, verse number 1. God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. All right? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Specific. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. All right, it's a great mystery how that God, that the heaven of heavens could not contain, could be contained or could be all God. In, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Imagine that. As a baby, that was true. Great mystery. Doesn't mean it's a lie. It's just a mystery. It's beyond you and I. You can't really fathom that, nor can I. But I know what it says. God was manifest in the flesh. So I get up here on Sunday night and I say, hey, uh, we run that every now and then, the paper, standing for the King James Bible without apology to anyone. And uh, I've never had to apologize in 28 years. I'll never have to apologize. I know that because one verse right here, not he who, God, that statement, God was manifest in the flesh. All the other Bibles, he who, well, he who, you were, you were, you were, he who, that not tell me anything, see? All that does is bring it from here down to here. Anybody without Greek or Hebrew knows which Bible is the Word of God by what it does with Jesus Christ. I mean, is the name above every name? Is his name to be exalted? Yes, it is. Then no problem whatsoever. God was manifest in the flesh. That's sound doctrine. To believe that Jesus Christ is God. So the JWs come to my door last week and I wasn't feeling too well. But all of a sudden I, I got a shot of strength. <laughs> Kind of like Mrs. Modoc. She said she came in this church in 1978. When she came into foyer, she said the spirit went through her and she knew this was a church. 
And she said, she went to these other churches, nothing. And she said she knew it right there. <laughs> and uh, that spirit went through me as well when I got up and uh, I wasn't feeling well. And they were at the door. And uh, I said, tell me what you think about Jesus Christ. And when they said he was a God, that spirit just fired up, you know. And uh, why wouldn't it? He is God. God was manifest in the flesh. That's sound doctrine. Look at chapter 6 and verse number 15. Chapter 6 and verse number 15. Uh, who, which in his, time, his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. A potentate is a king that possesses great power. And does he ever have great power? Uh, blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Everybody else is mortal, but he is immortal, who only hath immortality, dwelling a light which no man can approach unto. He's God manifest in the flesh. Look at Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Statement like First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 3 verse 4. God our Savior and to verse number 3. And, uh, and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior verse number 4. And with Godhead being what it is, a triunity, uh, he as well is called in Isaiah chapter 9, the everlasting Father, and that will be proven in the second coming, Revelation chapter number 1. All right, so to believe that, chapter 2, verse number 10, doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Our Savior is God. God was manifest in the flesh. That's sound doctrine. Orthodox Christianity has always believed that. I mean, didn't matter if you're Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Orthodox, anything unorthodox would be the cult who reject the major things that have always been believed by Christianity. Orthodox Christianity has always believed that Jesus Christ is God. Now we separate ourselves a little bit uh, from some of them, and that is uh, sound doctrine being eternal security. Whereas, you know, they say, you don't believe that damnable doctrine of uh, once saved, always saved. Yes, I believe in the eternal security of the believer in Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 12. 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom, not what, but whom, person of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Then Paul saying, look, I'm, I'm looking for him to come back, and I know that what I've laid on him, everything is going to be well. It'll be well with my soul until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back or till he takes me out of here. I'm uh, able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Look at chapter 2, verse number 13. It gets wilder all the time. All right, verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Now, it's a thing where sometime, uh, and of course you have the old nature that never is eradicated, sad to say, and sometimes it gets a hold of somebody and finally they think, oh, well, I don't even believe anymore. I, and they begin to doubt their self. It begins with a doubt. They finally come out saying, I don't even believe. And you know something, that doesn't even, if they actually got saved, they can say that, and they can feel that way. It doesn't change the fact they're still saved. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. When he comes in the form of the Holy Spirit and says, I'm going to abide with you forever, John chapter 14, verse number 16, that's exactly what he means. And he's going to abide faithful. He's not going to leave. All right, here's why. Whenever you get saved, your soul's cut loose from your uh, uh, flesh. And therefore, the flesh can sin. The soul doesn't get defiled. It remains saved. And it will always be saved. And the flesh can go off the deep end. Not the thing to do because there is sowing and reaping. And you want to reap everlasting life, you don't want to reap corruption. But if it does, the soul is still not defiled. The Holy Spirit can still remain in. He can still dwell there forever. And so... If it would come out all the way at the bottom, uh, you're dealing with a situation where he still abides faithful. And being faithful, he's going to be in there. 
and that, uh, say, worldly Christian is going to be a very unhappy Christian. They're going to be a very troubled Christian, and the Holy Spirit of God is going to trouble them, trouble them, trouble them, and one day down the line somewhere they finally get things right. All right? But uh, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Therefore, you can believe in the eternal security of the believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, look at chapter 2, verse uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse number 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, then, as well as other verses in the Word of God, you have eternal life, and it's not going to change. Nothing shall change that. God's given it to you. He's come in to abide forever. And if we believe not, he abideth faithful. You can believe in the eternal security of the believer in Jesus Christ. All right, because of verses like that, uh, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And look at verse number 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, as profess a good profession, before many witnesses. It's as though you called on the Lord, you testified that you called on the Lord, you, you've got eternal life, now lay hold on it. Don't go through your life thinking, I hope, I hope, I hope, and boy, when I get to the end of the rope, I hope I can, I hope I'm still hanging on. Somebody gave me an illustration the other day, said, tie a big knot in the end of the rope, and you feel like you're at the end of the rope, just hang on. Well, that's kind of a cute illustration. But scripturally, it's not you holding on. It's Christ in you that remains in you, your hope of glory. All right? But lay hold on eternal life. You've got it. And you'll always have it. And that'll never change. It can't, will not change. He's going to be faithful. And so, therefore, lay hold on it. You got it. Don't go through your life saying, oh, man, I, I, I'd like to have what he's got. I really wish I knew for sure. No, go by the word of God, and you got it. Now lay hold on. All right, verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, they may lay hold on eternal life. You've got it. Now lay hold on it and go to town. All right, uh, sound doctrine. Jesus is God. Sound doctrine. The eternal security of the believer. All right, sound doctrine. Sometimes in the word of God, you have a body truth set up before the foundation of the world. What am I saying? I'm saying it's a truth that in other ages was not made known, but something God in his foreknowledge had designed, had a plan for the age in which you and I live called the church age or the dispensation of the grace of God. All right? So a body truth is one thing, an individual truth in the church age is another thing. All right, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. See if you can get on this a little more, a uh, little, a uh, little tougher now, but this will work. Uh, verse nine: Who has saved us? All right, hath saved us, and called us with an holy calling. That's true of every believer, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Well, wait a minute. Was Paul in Christ Jesus? Before the world began? Were you in Christ Jesus before the world began? Paul never got in Christ Jesus until Acts chapter number 9. Then we are dealing with a truth for the body of Christ. A plan that God had laid out, known the end from the beginning, like he said he does. Read Isaiah 41, 2, 3, 4. Read those uh, chapters back there. He knows the end from the beginning. God had a design. Man had every opportunity in the world to, to get it right. Church age could have been skipped, but God had a plan for you and I, knowing how it was going to go, a plan for you and I, part of the body of Christ, and for the church age. What is it? It's for you and I to make manifest uh, the gospel. Uh, uh, end of verse number 10. Bring to light uh, through the gospel. All right, what do you do? You and I... We're called to what? Get out the gospel. I don't care if you're a lady. God wants you to get out the gospel. Get it out to another lady. Get it out to girls. Get it out in gospel tract form. You're not to be the preacher, but you can get it out. That's true of everybody in the body of Christ. That's the truth for the body of Christ. Now, but look at verse number 11. With that truth in mind, 
Verse number 11, you want to find out specifically what God wants out of you in this life. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. There's a specific will of God for you, although the general truth is for the body of Christ to get out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was something God had set up before the foundation of the world. That Paul was before the foundation of the world, a preacher, teacher, and apostle. He wasn't even in Christ until Acts chapter number 9. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse number 4. Stay with me if you can. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4. Because these are verses that the Calvinist goes off on. Anytime he sees before the foundation of the world, he goes bonkers. And he comes out teaching the elect and not. It doesn't go. It doesn't fly. It's a body truth. All right. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. All right, what's he have? He's got a plan before the foundation of the world that in the church age, which you and I live in right now, when somebody gets in him, they become one of his chosen or one of his elect. They are his, but they've got to get in him. And that's a plan God had for the body of Christ before the foundation of the world. I hope you can get on to that. That'll help you a whole lot. Thirty years ago, Brother Wayne Munn asked me about uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 9. It's a body truth. And verse number 11 specifically, I mean a general truth, one thing for the body, a specific truth for you and I as to the actual perfect will of God. And Paul even found that. All right, sound doctrine. Let's try one more. One more being right divisions. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then there's no way you can get your Bible if you're going to uh, throw it up like a bunch of popcorn and just grab, 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 grab. That's not the way you get it. You study. You don't throw anything up. You don't throw anything out. You study. You study when something seems to conflict. You rightly divide the word of truth. All right. I'll go back to First uh, Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse number 32. First Corinthians 10 verse 32. These are divisions. There's no doubt about these divisions. These are laid out in your Bible. This is one of the ways you rightly divide the word of truth. Giving none offense, neither to the Jews, number one, nor to the Gentiles, number two, nor to the church of God, number three. And that would be Jew or Gentile that saved. Jews as a nation, uh, Gentiles likewise, and church of God, saved people, Jew or Gentile, be part of the church of God. Then what you've got to do, you go, go through your Bible, and you've got to look and see who God is speaking to. And primarily the Old Testament is what? To his people, to his nation, to the Jews. Lessons, multitude of lessons for you and I. Uh, but look, you've got to, to get the Bible right. You can't go back there and you can't steal the promises of Israel and say, God's all done with Israel and I'm going to claim those promises for the church. No, he might have set them aside, which is a great mystery. But the promises that they have not gotten, they will get in due time. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. There are divisions. People act as though no divisions. I believe it all. I believe it all too, but I believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you don't do that, believe me, uh, things become very chaotic. I was reading Isaiah chapter 14 tonight. I read about uh, chapter uh, 14 of verse number 6. Uh, in his anger, picture the Antichrist. Next verse. And of course... To, Bible says in Proverbs 22, his anger is going to fail. It doesn't matter whether he rips, snorts, tears up, goes into rage and fury. It doesn't matter what he does. Lord Jesus Christ comes back and, I mean, brings him to ashes on the earth. His anger doesn't stop anything, doesn't do anything as far as the Lord's concerned. Next verse, the Bible speaks about rest, R-E-S-T. What do we do? Millennium. All right, once the Antichrist is subdued, you got chance of something going on. He's the hard taskmaster. He's the irate one, the angry one. All right? Then you go on into the millennium. All right? If you rightly divide the word of truth, it clears it up. 
Verse 6, verse 7 becomes very clear. All right, so you've got to get Jew, Gentile, and God. You've got to get pre, post, and all millennialism. You've got to get church age salvation, listen to me, tribulation salvation, millennial salvation, and you've got to get the distinction between those uh, three groups. I say that because of Ephesians chapter 3, and I'll close, I guess. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse number 2, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, all right, dispensation's a Bible word. The grace of God, that's the age in which you and I live. Church age salvation has no works connected to it. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's church age salvation. That is not tribulation salvation, nor is it millennial age salvation. That's church age salvation, nor is it Old Testament. Wait a minute. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 5. Which in other ages was not made known. Then there was a time they did not know what you and I know. They did not know that in this age salvation is by the grace of God, no works connected to it, by the grace of God alone. You put your faith in finished work of Jesus Christ, and He saves your soul by His marvelous, matchless grace. Thank God for His grace. They did not know that back then, which in other ages was not made known. If it wasn't made known, God going to send them to hell because they didn't even know it? Oh, no. If they didn't know it, they're clear. I mean, no law, no transgression, right? All right? Uh, but that's not the story. There was a problem. It was just distinct back there. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to study to get her down. All right? You've got to get dispensational salvation down. In most churches, most Baptist churches, if somebody like myself were to teach dispensational salvation, they would go bonkers. They would, man, they wouldn't even finish out the service. They'd go wild. They'd say, man, that guy's a heretic. Bemis had a uh, revival out in Idaho and tried to teach dispensational salvation. They, man, they pitched him out after about two nights. He never even got done. Never got to finish the revival meeting. You study to show yourself approved unto God. And if God approves of you, then you don't need to worry about anything else. A workman that needeth not, there is work connected with it. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly, not wrongly, rightly dividing the word of truth. Their right divisions. Now, I want to talk to you about uh, dispensational salvation next time. I want to talk to you about the last days of the church age as described in First, Second Timothy chapter 3 and the last days of the tribulation as described in Acts chapter 2 and Joel chapter number 2. That's called rightly dividing the word of truth. There's right divisions. And you've got to get them down or your Bible, I mean, it becomes a Duke's mixture. You never can get it right. I need to talk to you about resurrection. And the first resurrection does not end until Revelation chapter 20, verse number 5. I need to talk to you about salvation for all, not the elect or particular redemption. The inspiration of scriptures, all from 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus primarily. So when he says, you're my son in the faith, and he says, I don't want you to go down. And my job is to keep you sound in doctrine. And he said, look, there's always going to be that problem. With the new convert, there's the problem. With the uh, elder or the bishop, there's the problem of trying to grab something new that maybe nobody else has. Uh, with the aged man, there's going to be the problem. Uh, with the young man, there's going to be the problem. There's always that problem. And Paul says, look, I want you to be sound in doctrine. The day will come and not endure sound doctrine. But uh, I want you to be sound. And as I think of it, that day is absolutely upon us because nowadays and for quite some time they have thrown out doctrine for experience uh, for one thing or another. They have thrown it out and as far as I'm concerned, a ministry, this ministry, rises or falls on sound doctrine being maintained from this pulpit.
First Timothy chapter 4, verse number 16. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the Word of God, and we're thankful, Lord, uh, for instruction and exhortation you've given to us. And, Lord, so much in little short books about doctrine, may we never de-emphasize it for the sake of anybody, for the sake of a crowd, for the sake of a drawn whoever, whatever. God, help us to maintain sound doctrine always in the ministry of this church. And Father, I pray, Lord, you give some sweet fellowship, and I pray, Lord, as the crowd travels, that you would keep them safe, uh, give them a good time as they travel, an enjoyable time. Nothing else, Lord, may they fellowship with you. But God, we do ask you another time for safety. As Ron and Linda go down the road, Lord, this weekend, God, as well, we ask it. The angel Lord would camp around, around about him, Lord, and deliver him and keep him safe. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that's it for now. Don't forget next Wednesday night we'll have a business meeting. I don't think there's any officers to vote on, but need to go over the money situation so you know that everything, as far as I would know, would be in order. Okay, that's it, and thanks for coming to prayer meeting.